Today we will learn and reflect on the work in the Philokalia by St. John Cashin, who spent years living and praying as a monk in the Egyptian desert monasteries, and then brought the Eastern monastic tradition to the West, settling in what is today France. His writings became the basis of the Western monasticism of St. Benedict. At the end of our talk, we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. Please, we welcome you to follow along in our PowerPoint scripts we uploaded to SlideShare. We welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. John Cashin served as a monk in both a Bethlehem monastery and in Egypt under St. Evagrios. And he traveled to Constantinople where he became an ardent supporter of St. John Chrysostom. He learned much under such spiritual masters, and when he returned home to Roman Gaul, he taught the teachings of the early church fathers, which are commended in the rule of St. Benedict. St. John Cashin's teachings in the Philokalia mirror the teachings in the Ladder of Divine Ascent. His teachings on the Eight Vices are advice to those seeking salvation as monks, so we must discern how these teachings apply to those of us who seek salvation in the secular world. Indeed, imagine what advice he would give to us living in the secular modern world to resist the vices of gluttony, unchastity, avarice, anger, dejection, listlessness, self-esteem, and pride. The early church fathers always talk about fasting, the struggle against gluttony, as the first vice to conquer. Once you conquer fasting, the other vices have become easier to conquer. The spiritual life is all about changing your habits, adopting good habits, discarding bad habits, Indeed, habitually seeking to change your daily habits for the good. St. John Cashin is eager to say that his teachings are not his own, that they have been passed down by the Church Fathers. St. John Cashin teaches us that a one-day fast can be better than a fast lasting many days. For what good is fasting when you break the fast with a feast? Eat too much and the food makes you too sleepy for prayers. Eat too little and you have too little energy for prayers. And he notes that everyone is different. Some are satisfied with half a pound of bread. Others can eat two pounds of bread and still be hungry. Quoting St. John Cashin, A clear rule for self-control is this. Stop eating while still hungry and do not continue until you are satisfied. Fasting alone does not make our soul any purer unless we also cultivate the other virtues, such as humility, obedience, freedom from avarice, freedom from anger, freedom from despair, and freedom from pride. When we fast, we must pray. Fasting without prayer is not really fasting. Quoting St. John Cashin, Bodily fasting alone is not enough to bring about perfect self-restraint and true purity. It must be accompanied by contrition of heart, intense prayer to God, frequent meditation on the scriptures, and toil in manual labor. St. John Cashin teaches that fasting, guarding against the vice of gluttony, is but beginning the struggle to live a godly life. Indeed, he who has trampled down the pleasures and provocations of the flesh is, in a certain sense, outside the body. Thus, no one can soar to this high and heavenly price of holiness on his own wings and learn to imitate the angels, unless the grace of God leads him upwards from this earthly mire. We must not only watch what we eat, we must watch what we think. As we seek to conquer the next vice, the demon of unchastity and the desire of the flesh. St. John Cashin teaches us. Humility of soul helps more than anything else. We must take the utmost care to guard the heart from base thoughts. Contrition and humility comes from sincere confession and repentance. In contrast, what does the world encourage? Be passionate. Give in to your passions. You're not alive if you're not passionate. Now, how much thought do we give to the junk we watch on television and in the movies and to the radio stations we listen to? What spiritual messages does this media blare? If the church fathers were to live today, what would they tell us about television and the movies? Now, entertainment is not all bad, but should entertainment be the focus of our life? St. John Cashin warns us that if our lustful and impure thoughts grow stronger because we assent to them, we will not be able to overcome them without much pain and labor. And the church fathers list the vices roughly in the order in which they torment us. That's gluttony, unchastity, avarice, anger, dejection, listlessness, self-esteem, and pride. And the next vice avarice, St. John Cashin, equates with idolatry. For instead of worshiping God, we worship money and riches. Gluttony and unchastity are listed first as they are instinctual drives present from birth, whereas avarice is acquired through an evil and perverse use of our free will. 
When your soul is imprisoned by avarice, you become miserly like Scrooge. You become irritable and resentful, always grumbling, always complaining, never satisfied, never obedient, behaving like a stubborn, uncontrollable horse. And the next vice, the demon of anger, darkens the depths of our souls with his deadly poison. St. John Cashin teaches us that as long as the demon of anger dwells in our hearts and blinds the eyes of our hearts with his somber disorders, then we can neither discriminate what is for our good, nor achieve spiritual knowledge, nor fulfill our good intentions, nor can we participate in true life, and our intellect will remain impervious to the contemplation of the true divine light. Also, no matter what provokes it, anger blinds the soul's eyes, preventing it from seeing the sun of righteousness. It is not enough to simply refrain from showing our anger. We must avoid angry thoughts. St. John Cashin teaches us, when we have dug out the root of anger out of our heart, we will no longer act with hatred or envy. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, for he kills himself with the hatred in his mind. He reminds us that Matthew 5 exhorts us that if we go to the altar and remember our brother has something against us, that the Lord commands us to leave our offering before the altar and be reconciled with our brother since our offering will not be acceptable so long as anger and rancor are bottled up within us. St. John Cashin teaches us, Self-reform and peace are not achieved through the patience which others show us, but through our own long-suffering towards our neighbor. And we must read the works of the early church fathers with some discernment, and we need to remember that these works are often directed to those trying to live a monastic life. For those of us living in the secular world, it is impossible not to feel anger towards someone who is trying to destroy us. And we remember that many of the psalms are sung about the anger the psalmist feels towards his persecutors. Anger is an emotion we all feel. The church fathers teach us that we must never nurture anger. We must never feed our angry feelings. We must never let the sun set down on our anger. If the church fathers were alive today, certainly they would advise us that when we drive our cars, it is not only pointless but harmful to our souls to yell at the other drivers who never hear us. Now I'll share some advice that I often share in our divorce support groups. And if we go through an ugly divorce, when someone has hurt us physically or financially and we can never completely recover, we may be like the man who cried out to Jesus. Jesus, I believe, help me in my unbelief. And so maybe we can also pray, Jesus, I forgive, help me to forgive. Sometimes when someone hurts us deeply and permanently, forgiveness is a long and repetitive process. But a message to the ladies, if we're suffering physical abuse in a marriage, in the short run, it is far more important to escape from the abuse than to worry about controlling our anger or forgiving them. There is one type of anger that is a virtue rather than a vice, and that's the anger we feel towards our own sinfulness. St. John Cashin quotes Psalm 4, Be angry and do not sin, teaching us that we can be angry with our own passions and our own malicious thoughts, and we should not sin by carrying out their suggestions. But even here we should not remain in our anger, but rather flee to repent to God of our sins. When malicious thoughts enter our heart, we should expel them with anger and return to compunction and repentance as if your soul were resting in a bed of stillness. And the demons of dejection and listlessness go hand in hand. And St. John Cashin warns us that when the malicious demon of dejection and despair seizes our soul and darkens it completely, he prevents us from praying gladly, from reading Holy Scripture with profit and perseverance, and keeps us from being gently and compassionate towards our brethren. Just as a moth devours clothing and a worm devours wood, so dejection devours a man's soul. Dejection persuades him to shun every helpful encounter and stops him from accepting advice from his true friends or giving them a courteous and peaceful reply. It was the demon of dejection that kept Cain from repenting of the murder of his brother. And it was the demon of dejection that kept Judas from repenting of the betrayal of his Lord and Savior. Likewise, St. John Cashin teaches us that the demon of listlessness cannot be beaten off except through prayer, through avoiding useless speech, and through the study of Holy Scripture, and through patience in the face of temptation. We in the modern world can quickly agree that many who fall prey to listlessness do not work, and no good can come from someone who does not want to work for a living. We're reminded of the bored Beavis and Butthead teenagers when they hear this teaching of St. John Cashin. The unruly man who does not work is lacking in reverence, impulsive in speech, quick to abuse, and is unfit for stillness. He is a slave to listlessness, and without respect we cannot love. There is one type of dejection and despair that is a virtue rather than a vice, and that is the dejection we feel when we ponder our own sinfulness. 
St. John Cassian teaches us. This godly sorrow nourishes the soul through the hope engendered by repentance and is mingled with joy. Repentance leads not to dejection and despair, but rather leads us to the true joy we feel when we love God and when we love our neighbors as ourselves. Similarly, in the ladder of divine ascent, despair keeps us from the salvific hope of Jesus. In the last pair of demons we must battle also go hand in hand and are difficult to distinguish, and that is the demons of self-esteem and pride. Lock the front doors of the church to shut out Satan, and the deceiver will slither under the back door. So it is with self-esteem and pride. We can never escape this pair of demons. They are like the floor. We can count on them to always be there when we fall. As St. John Cashin teaches us, when this demon cannot seduce a man with extravagant clothes, it tries to tempt him with shabby clothes. When it cannot flatter a man with honor, it inflates him by causing him to endure what seems to be dishonor. When it cannot persuade him to feel proud of his display of eloquence, it entices him through silence into thinking that he has achieved stillness. The demon of pride is the demon who pulls the nearly perfect from the upper rungs of the ladder of divine ascent into the dark abyss below, as St. John Cashin teaches us. The passion of pride darkens the soul completely and leads to its utter downfall. We must remember the words of Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Can pride ever be good? Why is it bad to be proud, since pride is the root of all evil? But yet, why is it so good when we tell our children how proud we are of them? Perhaps this dichotomy is similar to the teachings on judgment, how we should never judge our neighbor, always thinking the best of our neighbor, but being quick to judge ourselves, finding fault in ourselves so we can truly repent and live a godly life, giving up our old sinful habits. Similarly, when we have pride in ourselves, we see that we are better than our neighbors, which leads us to using our neighbor, taking advantage of our neighbor, despising our neighbor, murdering our neighbor in our heart, and possibly even stealing from our neighbor. But when we encourage others, when we encourage our children, we are encouraging the good in them to grow like rain waters the flowers, like the sun who shines on the good and the evil, like the father who takes pity on his children. So we should take pride in the accomplishments of others, but our own accomplishments should be credited to the grace of God, who puts us here on earth to worship Him. There is a story that St. John Climacus tells us in the Ladder of Divine Ascent about the monk who said he was not guilty of the sin of pride. St. John Climacus asks him, What further proof do I need that you are guilty of the sin of pride, than you proclaiming so proudly that you are not? And now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. This work by St. John Cassian is found in Volume 1 of the Philokalia, and it is really easy to read. We encourage you to pick up a copy. And we also recommend this book covering the Philokalia, although there's no essay on St. John Cassian. There are many other good essays. We also have the video on the history of the Philokalia and a sampling from its glossary. And we also have a link to the Mystagogy website that has many of the saints' pictures we use, which also has some interesting excerpts from the writings of our saint. And of course, a full picture of the thumbnail of Mount Athos Monastery we used in our picture with the tour guide boat. And the reason why there's a tour guide boat is you can only reach these monasteries from the water. And you can only stay for the day. You can't stay overnight unless you're an Orthodox male and have special permission from the abbots. The YouTube description links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.